Thank you, um, everyone, for joining today's telepressor. My name is uh, Stacey Sanders, and I'm the Federal Policy Director with the Medicare Rights Center. Um, we're very grateful to have you on the call this afternoon, and we're also very grateful to be joined by the Honorable Henry A. Waxman, a distinguished member of the House of Representatives for over 40 years, a ranking member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and a longtime champion for the families who rely on Medicare. Also joining our program today is Joe Baker, President of the Medicare Rights Center, and Dr. Ben Vecti, Research Director of Social Security Works. Together, our speakers will bring attention to the longstanding need to address the rising cost of prescription drugs in the Medicare program. And at the same time, our panelists will provide important context to this critical debate, offering up the facts on the strained financial circumstances facing many people with Medicare. At the close of this call, the Medicare Rights Center and Social Security Works will release a joint report titled, A Winning Strategy for Medicare Savings, Better Prices on Prescription Drugs, detailing policy recommendations to secure Medicare savings and to bring down prescription drug prices in Medicare. While some members of Congress propose shifting added health care costs to people with Medicare to create savings for the federal government, Others, like Congressman Waxman, know that the federal government can secure Medicare savings without worsening the health and economic well-being of seniors and people with disabilities. And now I will turn the call over to Congressman Waxman. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. I'm pleased to be with you, and I want to congratulate the Medicare Rights Center and Social Security Works for the release of their new report today. Uh, your research presents policy solutions for the critically important problem of reducing the cost of drugs for the Medicare program. Medicare spends tens of billions of dollars each year on prescription drugs and inexplicably pays some of the highest prices. The Medicare Part D program provides an important benefit for seniors. We improve the program immensely in the Affordable Care Act when we close the Part D donut hole. However, one big problem with Part D is that the private insurers that run the program are not able to effectively negotiate for lower prices. And in fact, in the Medicare Part D bill itself, uh, there's a provision that uh, says the government is not permitted to negotiate better prices for the Medicare program, even though the Medicare program offers millions of customers uh, for those pharmaceuticals. Uh, the oversight work uh, that we conducted and independent analysis by CBO, the HHS Inspector General, and others have concluded that Medicare Part D pays more for prescription drugs than the Veterans Administration, private insurers, and the Medicaid program. The result of that is that seniors and disabled people enrolled in Medicare Part D pay higher premiums and higher co-pays, while the taxpayers join them in spending tens and even hundreds of billions of dollars in extra costs. When President Bush signed the Part D benefit into law, I predicted that it would result in a massive giveaway to drug manufacturers, and unfortunately, I was right. This giveaway is particularly egregious when it comes to drugs for dual eligible beneficiaries. These are seniors who are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid because prior to 2006, the federal government paid for these people under the, their drugs under the Medicaid program and received substantial discounts. So what did the Republicans do in 2006? these seniors were switched to Medicare Part D, and so the federal government still pays for their drugs, but taxpayers are now paying substantially more for the exact same drugs. They lost, the, uh, they and we lost the discount that Medicaid requires in paying for these pharmaceuticals. The poster child for high Medicare Part D drug prices will soon be a drug called Sovaldi. It's a hepatitis C drug manufactured by Gilead. The company is charging $84,000 for a course of treatment. Why are they charging that? Because they have a monopoly and they can charge whatever they want. Uh, a recent analysis by researchers from 
Georgetown University and the Kaiser Family Foundation found that Medicare Part D coverage for Savaldi alone will increase Medicare drug spending by $6.5 billion, or 8% in 2015. That's an astounding amount for just one drug. So we're going to increase our spending for drugs in Medicare by 8% just next year. Why will Savaldi cost so much for the Medicare program? Well, the researchers are telling us, quote, Part D sponsors ha- uh, have little negotiating power. This drug is not unique. Part D plans are not able to obtain significant discounts on many expensive drugs. So they, one of the policy options highlighted by the Medicare Rights Center and Social Security Works is a rebate on Part D drugs. And I've introduced legislation, the Medicare Drug Savings Act, to put this rebate into effect. If we required the rebate, we could, without cutting taxes or cutting Medicare benefits for seniors, the Medicare Drug Savings Act would save taxpayers over $140 billion in the next decade. And this is something that Congress should be willing to agree on. We could save that money lower the deficit, and not ask seniors to pay more. The only opposition, of course, is the drug companies because they'll make a a little less money if they have somebody negotiating prices with them. The Medicare Rights Center report also highlights savings options for Medicare Part B. Uh, Those drugs under Medicare Part B uh, require taxpayers to spend over $10 billion every year for those drugs, and it's important we look to see if there are savings possibilities there as well. I commend the Medicare Rights Center and Social Security Works on the report released today. I also appreciate their efforts to protect and improve Medicare and Social Security. I hope Congress will consider our Part D rebate legislation and these other approaches recommended in the new report released today. These policy options show how we can improve Medicare benefits and cut the deficit without increasing taxes or cutting benefits for senior seniors. That ought to be a goal that everyone should support. And uh, I, I hope we can uh, get members uh, to support this legislation, even though one of the biggest campaign contributors around, uh, Pharma, uh, is certainly going to pull out all the stops to fight us. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Uh, And next up, we have Joe Baker, President of the Medicare Rights Center. Thank you, Congressman Waxman, and thank you, everyone, for being on the phone today. Um, We certainly appreciate the opportunity to put out this information and have enjoyed um, the cooperation and and working with Social Security Works in bringing uh, this issue to light. Um, and certainly are thankful for all of the efforts of Congressman Waxman and, and his colleagues on the Hill um, that are working in this area to uh, to solve these problems ongoingly. Um, we're sitting in a moment right now where there's a lot of good news to report about Medicare fi- Medicare's finances uh, for a variety of reasons, but one of them, of course, is uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act and, and reforms that were uh, enacted in, the, in for the Medicare program there. Medicare uh, per capita growth has uh, slowed to record lows, um, and uh, according to you know recent indi- reports, uh, uh, the trust fund is solvent uh, through 2026, which is one of the longest times it's in, in its history. And we'll see on Monday um, <clears throat> what the trustees come out with, but they're expected to project additional years of solvency. Um, that doesn't mean that the Congress, and certainly Congressman Waxman, has not been. Uh, idle. Uh, uh, we need to continue to look at where we can uh, drive efficiency for Medicare, uh, not only to save taxpayers money, but also, of course, to save uh, beneficiaries, people with Medicare money. Um, and uh, I think here, the emergence of block bu- bu- blockbuster drugs, like Congressman Waxman referred to, um, Savaldi in particular, uh, is an important uh, lesson for us and, and should be a wake-up call uh, for uh, those legislators uh, in Congress that have not been focused on this issue. Um, as the congressman you know, very aptly and very accurately uh, portrayed, this is a very expensive drug and a very effective one, which is wonderful, uh, but very expensive. Um, and Medicare is prohibited from uh, negotiating
charging a discounted price for it. While each uh, Medicare Part D prescription drug plan will be out there trying to negotiate a price, they do not have the number of insureds, the number of covered lives, um, the number of people enrolled in their programs that Medicare as a whole does, and so therefore they cannot drive the discounts uh, that Medicare as a whole could if it was negotiating uh, for all people with Medicare. Um, for example, uh, in the uh, in a report that uh, Tricia Newman, Jack Hoadley, and uh, Julia Kubansky did in Health Affairs, they showed that the Veterans Administration could get a 44% discount uh, on Solvaldi uh, moving forward. So I think that is a, a lesson when you can leverage lives. We all know the lesson of Costco and other kinds of buying clubs. Uh, numbers count when you're trying to get, uh, trying to buy things, and that certainly holds true uh, for life-saving prescriptions drugs. Um, so, you know, once again, um, I think our report shows several policy options um, that the the congressman also sketched out. Um, the most straightforward for for securing uh, prescription drug uh, savings uh, very quickly. Um, if enacted, would be simply, as the congressman said, to get those Medicaid rebates that we left on the table back in 2006 um, when we switched everyone from who was a dual eligible from Medicaid to Medicare. Their rebates did not follow them. And um, if we were able to do that, it's estimated we would save $141 billion um, over the next 10 years. Um, and certainly uh, there are a variety of legislation out there, but uh, uh, Congressman Waxman, Waxman and Senator Rockefeller's uh, Medicare Drug Savings Act would, would accomplish that and get us those rebates again. Um, I think the other piece, of course, and one that would take additional thinking, but uh, you know, poll after poll confirms that most Americans believe this, this is something we should be doing, and that is – exploring allowing the Medicare program to neg negotiate the price of drugs. Um, regardless of political affiliation, Americans think this is something we should be exploring um, and that Medicare should be allowed to negotiate these drugs. Um, and certainly, as we can see with the VA, uh, they could get considerable discounts. Um, and finally, uh, I think the Medicare program uh, could also be strengthened and, and the Part D program could also be strengthened by allowing Medicare, the original Medicare program run by the federal government, to offer a drug plan. Um, uh, and that might be one way to, to negotiate prices, but it also might be one way to for Medicare to uh, compete directly with uh, private Part D plans. Um, so I think you know those are all options that are on the table. Um, uh, certainly, we're open to other uh, solutions to allow the Medicare program to secure better prices on prescription drugs. Uh, but we really do believe that this is a winning strategy uh, to save money and, and keep a high-quality uh, health care system for the federal government, uh, you know, for people with Medicare and for uh, American taxpayers. So thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Great. Thank you, Joe. Um, and finally, we have Dr. Ben Vecti with Social Security Works. Thank you, Stacey. Um, the vast majority of Medicare beneficiaries, 42.1 million seniors and 8.5 million people with disabilities, uh, receive Social Security benefits and live on modest fixed incomes, averaging only about $15,000 per year, which is about the same as a minimum wage level income. Meanwhile, the burden of out-of-pocket health care costs has risen 34% in real terms since 1992, outpacing Social Security cost of living adjustments by more than a third. Seniors' out-of-pocket uh, health care costs have risen from $3,865 a year in 1992 to $5,197 per year in 2010 on average, eating up an ever greater share of Social Security retirement uh, benefit checks as well as checks of, of those on SSDI. For the average senior, out-of-pocket medical costs now eat up a third of their Social Security benefits. Obviously, for those requiring particularly costly care and for older retirees, an, ever, an even larger share of their Social Security checks goes to health care costs, leaving these seniors and people with disabilities with less money to live on and forcing these people to make extremely burdensome trade-offs, having to decide between health care and basic necessities like food or heating. Proposals to increase premiums, deductibles, and other cost sharing ignore this widespread economic insecurity among older Americans and people with disabilities. Further cost shifting would endanger the health of seniors and people with disabilities and their ability to age in dignity. Several studies, as well as common sense, suggest that further cost shifting would result 
and cash-strapped seniors and people with disabilities foregoing necessary care. Moreover, shifting health care costs is a dead end and a recipe for failure in Medicare policy. If we allow cost sharing to continue to increase as a means to deal with Medicare budget pressures, in a decade or two, more than half of Social Security benefits could be eroded by Medicare out-of-pocket health care costs. Congress needs to stop this cost shifting now, focusing instead on cost-saving possibilities that do not hurt beneficiaries, such as the Medicare Drug Savings Act championed by Congressman Waxman and Senator Rockefeller. Our system of health care provision is twice as expensive as, as those of most other Western countries, with more cost sharing and worse health outcomes. There is ample room to cut costs in our health care system without lowering quality of care, as Joe Baker has outlined in his remarks, and as our brief to be released after this call elaborates in greater detail. Congress should pursue cost savings in Medicare and these common sense reform proposals, rather than in further cost shifting to the elderly and people with disabilities. With that, I would like to hand it off to our Communications Director, Lacey Crawford, to field any questions. Sure. Uh, thank you, Ben. Um, I'm Lacey Crawford, Communications Director of Social Security Works. So, at this time, if there are any reporters on the line who would like to ask a question, I ask that you now press uh, star six on your phone, and that way you'll be able to, um, to ask a question and be placed in our queue. So, um, Stacy and Ben, I'm going to wait a second while any reporters with a question uh, queue up. Great. All right, it looks like we have one question. Uh, this is uh, actually I have uh, two or three here, but uh, I'll, I'll start off with this one uh, for Congressman Waxman. Do you believe that there should be a separate path for for cures for for curative drugs that spans the the financing of research through FDA product reviews and reimbursement? Uh, if, if you had, a, it seems as though the current system is not set up well. Uh, to handle drugs that actually, actually cure conditions? Before a drug can be approved, the Food and Drug Administration has to uh, review clinical trials to be sure the drug is safe and effective. Now, that doesn't mean it's particularly an improvement over therapies that we already might have available to us. So I think we ought to evaluate whether there is a benefit, a benefit by going to a new drug, which could be a lot more expensive than the older therapies. Uh, I think that uh, pharmaceutical companies make huge investments in research and development of drugs, and oftentimes they put money into uh, drugs that don't turn out to be very effective or, or work, and so they lose that money. But when they uh, hit, a, hit it with a drug that's needed and successful, they can make billions of dollars on that drug. The, the approach that we took several decades ago with Senator Hatch and the Hatch-Waxman Act was that we would recognize the patent period, which means no one can produce another drug uh, that's the same as the one that's just been developed until the expiration of a period of time on the patent uh, that patent, however, runs concurrently with the time for review at the FDA. So we uh, passed a law trying to restore some of that patent period that uh, was taken by the bureaucratic review. I don't say bureaucratic review in a negative way, but just a review by the people or public employees at FDA or their, or their uh, expert panels. And so we get, restore some of that at, in exchange for generic drugs being approved immediately after the period of time is over for the patent and that extra time we give them for uh, for FDA review. And then under certain circumstances, we give them more, up to five years more uh, to hold on to their monopoly. Uh, I, I, I think that that was supposed to work well, but when you have companies with a monopoly, it means they can charge whatever they think the market will bear. And if it's an insurance payer, they're willing to just really put that price at an exorbitantly high level because in many cases, like the Sovaldi drug, 
it's hard for an insurance company to say we're not going to pay for the, a drug that is a real breakthrough and a real important therapy. That's where Medicare is uh, in approaching it, although a lot of states under Medicaid aren't going to cover the drug, and a lot of private insurance companies may or may not uh, provide for that drug for the people in that insurance plan. Uh, the whole system is premised on the idea that there will be some restraint, some self-restraint in the amount that's charged, uh, uh, which would allow them to recoup their investments and get a, uh, a reasonable return on their money, but not excessive, not a windfall. And right now we're getting some drug companies are just absolutely getting windfalls at uh, everybody else's expense. Thank you for that. And do you think that the current system uh, is geared more toward uh, encouraging drug makers to invent treatments for chronic diseases as opposed to inventing drugs that actually get rid of, that you know that actually cure is is yeah oh i think that uh, the drug companies are are looking to see whatever therapy might work i don't i don't know they they may but i don't know that they would uh be more interested in a drug for um uh, chronic long-term use as opposed to uh, an acute care use. But I, I do know that they're motivated by profits. And when we looked at the situation with rare diseases, we found that drug companies were not developing drugs for rare diseases because the patient population was so small that they didn't see the potential for a big profit they would get if there were a large numbers of people buying a drug. Well, they do make that calculation, but we adopted the Orphan Drug Act because some of these diseases became orphan diseases when the drug companies wouldn't make drugs for them. And that gave them some more incentive to develop these drugs. But it's now at the point where the drug companies are focusing more on these rare diseases because they know if they get a drug for a rare disease and people have insurance for that coverage, they can get a huge amount of money back for that orphan drug. So they're they're looking to see what they can uh, market. Uh, at, but I think a lot of them are, are trying to develop cures, and, uh, uh, and they're rewarded with a monopoly during the time they have con uh, that drug available to them because of the of the patent and the Hatch Waxman Act. Okay, and and if if I may ask a a, a completely different question, I was looking through uh, some of the uh, proposals to control drug spending, both in the report and also, uh, Congressman Waxman, in, in your in your bill. Um, do you worry that the the trade deal that the USTR is negotiating, that's the Trans Pacific Partnership, the TPP, do, do you worry that 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 trade deal could thwart any of these proposals, I ask because uh, Public Citizen has, you know, says that that is a possibility, but I don't quite fully understand it, and I was hoping that uh, you all could speak to that. I, I, I've, I've been talking to the trade representative who's negotiating this agreement and emphasize the point that uh, we don't want a trade agreement that tells other countries that they can't approve a generic drug. Uh, they could take longer to approve a generic drug than we would have in the United States. For example, a country that's poor, just developing, they can't afford to pay the, brand, the cost for the brand name drug for people in their health care systems. So they desperately want to get a uh, generic, which is always cheaper. Uh, what the pharma companies were suggesting to our trade representative is that a country that didn't approve the the drug for use in that country to start with, a brand name drug, shouldn't be allowed to produce a generic until a period of time after they approved it. Well, they're not interested in improving quickly approving a drug that their people can't afford. So we're, they're, we're looking at the inequities in a trade deal that uh, might uh, hurt developing countries be able to get these drugs. And if, if you get the HIV AIDS drugs, we're paying for them in the United States for these developing countries. 
uh, and as as uh, a, a human gesture to save people, but we should then have to pay the highest prices for those drugs if we can get a generic alternative. Got it. Thank you very much. All right. I ask that any reporters asking questions, please state your name and your outlet. Um, and it does look like we have another question. Hi, this is Julie Appleby with Kaiser Health News. How are you? Um, this is a question for the congressman. I'm wondering, what is the current status of this legislation, and what are the prospects that Congress will take it up and actually uh, have some kind of vote on it this, this session? I think it's highly unlikely, one, the session's almost over, and we're going into the election. We may have a, uh, a, a let what's called a lame duck session after the election, but I have not seen any interest on the part of the Republicans to uh, do something that would hold down the cost for these drugs. Their approach to health care spending is to simply shift the costs onto people. For Medicare, for example, rather than have Medicare continue paying the doctors and the hospitals and the other health care providers, they would just say to people, oh, well, we'll give you a voucher and you go buy a private insurance plan and hope you can find one as good as Medicare. Uh, and that way they would save money by saying this is the all we're going to spend on you. That, of course, would shift the costs on to a lot of people who couldn't afford it. So uh, I don't think it's likely this session and uh, and Republicans, but even a lot of Democrats uh, look into the drug companies for their campaign support. I, I think it's our whole campaign funding system is, cor is corrupting, but it uh, has its impact where people are more worried about getting their financial support from the contributors than they are about uh, helping their elderly and disabled people in their districts on Medicare who are facing this financial cost crisis. Now, Congressman, you, I, I believe you've also asked the maker of Sovaldi a number of questions uh, in recent weeks and months, and I'm wondering what they're telling you about the pricing of this drug. How did they set the pricing, and what what are they doing? What what are they thinking about the new uh, range of drugs that are expected to be out either this fall or early next year for hepatitis C? What's the pricing going to look like on those? Have you had some response uh, from them? Well, we've asked them for information, and they've failed so far to give us all the information we've requested. But I think their attitude is uh, they can get away with it. I was interested when we wrote them a letter asking them how they could possibly charge so much money for this drug where people can't afford it, governments can't afford it, insurance plans can't afford it, uh, their stock dropped. But the reality was that um, unless Congress acts, they can get away with it. And uh, their greed is, is going to be unrestrained. I'd say it's their greed. They haven't proved to me it's not because uh, their investment is well cut returned uh, by a, a reasonable price, and I think they're charging an unreasonable price. Okay, thank you. I'm going to have to leave to to catch a vote on the House floor, but I hope this helps, and I'm sure others there can answer questions that the press may have. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right, thank you, Congressman. Thank you.